nobody's asking for the, the Christian expert spokesman. So homegrown leaders who mm. are Christians who are known, that's, that's just effective strategy. So I think mm. that's one of the many reasons that the future is going to have more and more part-time bivocational, yeah. co-vocational leaders. Joining us today are Andy Littleton and Sean Benish. These two guys have written a book called Part-Time Pastoring about being a part-time pastor, bivocational pastor. Guys, we're glad to have you joining us today. Hey, good to be here. Yep, likewise. Well, let me start off by uh, getting you to kind of unpack something for us. You know, years gone by, uh, there have always been uh, bivocational pastors or part-time pastors, as you have termed it. Uh, I shared with you a moment ago, even my granddaddy was a a uh, bivocational pastor working in Atlanta in the GM plant, pastoring a church. So that's happened. And, and as uh, the Southern Baptist Convention particularly, but any of the other denominations have grown and moved west and moved north, it happened because of people who were bivocational. But there has been a shift in recent decades, for sure, that the feeling was you needed to be full-time in ministry. If you were going to be a pastor, you needed to be full-time. Uh, and so the bivocational wasn't near as normative. Uh, you, your feeling is from this book and what you've discussed that this is becoming more normative. Tell us, tell us why you think so. Well, I think there's a lot. I think there's a lot of layers and trends that make up this larger conversation. Um, so you're right. On, on one level, this idea of bivocationalism, like it's, it's, there's nothing new, right? We even have that term tent maker because we draw inspiration from Paul who, who made tents. And throughout church history, we can see kind of the ebbs and flows of this conversation. And, you know, particularly in the U.S. throughout the 20th century um, and just how that conversation shifted. But I think what is interesting is, you know, I think it's simultaneously on par with like an economic shift as well as we move uh, away from kind of being like a manufacturing economy into like a post-industrial, post-manufacturing economy, which has its own set of rules. So I think there's something to play at play there. But I think also part of it too is kind of the funding mechanism that we have seen undergird denominations is shifting. Like we see this in international missions. We would say like, oh, so much of funding comes from the baby boomer generation. Well, what's happening to the boomer generation? And we can see it's a, like, it's a generational conversation. It's an economic conversation. It's even like a marginalization conversation as the church continues to move away from mainstream into the margin. So I think there's a number of reasons why that shift continues to move us in that direction where I think we're seeing this conversation become not just on the fringe, like, but it's definitely more normative across denominations and networks and more. Yeah, and I think it's going to continue to be so. Uh, Andy, unpack for us a little bit what you felt were the, the real problems that you saw out there in ministry, the maybe you could use the term pain point that right. motivated you guys to come together and write this book. Why, why, I mean, there's some other books on, on bivocationalism. Why this one? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I think for me, it probably started when I actually was, was cruising through Portland and Sean and I got a coffee and, and I asked him, I believe it was at that time. I, I asked him, you know, how, who, who is exemplifying this type of, this type of ministry paradigm, you know, who should we be looking to? And he said, you are. And I was like, oh, really? And, uh, and that, that was surprising to me. I mean, I knew I was sort of doing it, but I kind of viewed my version of it as pretty, pretty JV level. And, uh, and then as we unpacked that a little bit more, I thought, you know, that, that's, uh, I guess I am doing, it. I guess I have been doing it for a while. And then I've, I've been a part of several conversations, um, kind of a, a micro church oriented conversations and, um, and other conversations in kind of older denominational settings. And I'm, I'm seeing a couple of things. Number one, that, yeah, there's a, there's a need to start kind of grassroots missional churches that don't fit within the normal paradigm. Um, number two, there are um, kind of established churches that are not going to be able to function the way that they used to for very long. And this idea of co-vocationalism, bivocationalism is one of the answers. And though there are some books out there, there still seem to be a ton of 
questions and not a lot of great examples of it having been done well. So I think we, we sort of looked at our track record and Sean and I both realized, yeah, we've been doing this for a bit. And so then Sean came to Tucson, took me out to Mexican food and uh, asked me to write a book with him. You know, probably could ask me to marry him at that point. It was almost the same sort of scenario. No, it was. Uh, uh, that, that scares me a little bit there. <laughs> well, yeah, we're not going there. But, it, uh, but no, it's yeah, we, we realize a lot of people are having this conversation mm. and probably they need more than just theoretical stuff. And they need yeah. to see more of people who've done it. Uh, yeah, well, I, and I'll jump in, too. And I think one of the common feedback I hear all the time because I work with church planners every day is a lot of the Bible conversation is even kind of projected from people who are not even Vivo, right? Mm -hmm. And so me, you know, Andy and myself are like, well, we're in it. Like, we're not spectacular. Like, we're not coming from like this great reverse engineering, like, oh, we've done this and now we're amazing. And look at our huge platform and status. And now you too should be, it's like, well, we do this. Like we're, we're in the trenches. Like we're literally in the midst of juggling this responsibility, that responsibility. And so it's like, well, how about we write it as actually like practitioners. Yeah. Another. Yeah. And, and I, I was just going to say it, it really is a, a good, easy read. A large part of my ministry has been bivocational and, and I appreciate you coming at it with that perspective. Uh, uh, I won't mention any names, but I remember there was a book came out yeah, 20 -ish years ago uh, about church planting and it just uh, hit the, the, hit the bookshelves by storm and people were buying it. Oh, this is so great. This is an authority and whatever. And I got to researching a little bit and found out the guy who wrote the book had never planted a church, <laughs> 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 but, but he was a good writer and he was a good researcher, but, but there, there wasn't anything practical in it in the sense of uh, what he could bring. So I appreciated that as I was reading this. Now, I will say this, we are going to drop links to the book and maybe even some of the other books, Sean, I know you've, you've written uh, to your church websites, that kind of thing into the description below. So uh, we want people to be able to check that out and be able to get that. But the book is a quick read uh, and, and it's, it's very engaging. It's very engaging. Um, let, let me ask you to unpack a little bit why you chose to use the term part-time pastoring rather than bivocational or co-vocational I hear people using now. Uh, people, uh, especially some who are in that role, kind of almost take offense at that, <laughs> that it's not part-time. So unpack yeah. that for us. Yeah, I'm excited. I want to hear from these people. I wanna, I'm looking for some more conflict in my, uh, my ministry experience. <laughs> I'd really like to have that conversation with them preferably on social media where it goes very well. Um, yeah. No, I mean, the, the short story, the, the short answer to that is because uh, if you know the term co-vocational, you've probably been down this rabbit hole for a minute. And, uh, and so if you don't, that's especially who I was thinking of aiming the book at. So I'm thinking of people like myself who, you know, 2014 or so, I'm trying to plant a kind of a grassroots little church and I'm looking at the situation. I'm looking at the eight people that I have and our desire to be missional and generous. And I'm going, well, there's one way we do that. And that's that I don't get paid. And, uh, and so we either, either I don't get paid or we don't plant a church I'm interested in. It's one of the two. I wasn't coming at it from, I didn't, I didn't come out of a seminary situation. I didn't, you know, I didn't have like a theory that somebody had kind of built into me. I was just problem solving. So for me, it, I never would have looked up, honestly, I didn't even have the word bivocational in my head. I definitely didn't have the word co-vocational in my head. So I would have looked up part-time pastor or something to that effect. So I Googled that because I thought that's where I once was before I got clued in on all these terms. And I saw there were a couple books and they weren't really promoting it. Um, the books that are aimed at somebody who's just entering into the conversation using that term part-time are really working out what to do if you, you like you have a problem, your, your ministry isn't working, you're going to have to go part time. And I thought, well, I'd like to stick a book into that Google search that encourages this and moves people toward what we would call bivocational or co-vocational ministry where you're because what I discovered along the way, of course, was that my business leveraged my ministry far better than my ministry leveraged my ministry, actually. And I've kind of always been kind of a every good endeavor, all, all of life is all for Jesus kind of person anyway. And I realized, oh, 
this is what I want to teach. I want to teach people who have jobs to be on a mission for Christ every day. I guess I get to live that out too. And that's what we're sharing. So anyway, that's the title of the book is to try to hit, find people who, uh, who haven't gotten the great titles yet. Um, and, uh, and look, you know, we throw those titles in the book so you can, you know, hang yeah. in there for a second. Yeah. Well, and well I'll, 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 I'll add on to that. So, and at the same time, while it does kind of poke some people in the ribs and rightly so, you know, clickbait a little, um, <laughs> but it's also, it's accurate, right? Cause we're not saying, cause we we're I would say we're operating under the framework, as you just said, like, well, everything is ministry. Yeah. So what we're simply talking about literally and, and basically is like, well, where's your paycheck come from? Yeah. Right. So my vocation has been the same since I came to faith in Christ coming out of high school. My, that vocation has not changed. But what has changed is my occupation or my myriad of occupations from a youth pastor, a church planter, church planning strategist, a professor, a mountain biking guide, like but that was still under the under the umbrella of my vocation. And yeah. so so part time is accurate in that you may literally, re, you know, get a part time pay or salary from a church. And then the other part of your income comes from somewhere else. So that is accurate. But we're not trying to kind of bifurcate to say, well, this is secular. This like it's still all ministry. It's all under this umbrella of vocation. And if we're being honest, the money conversation is often a big part of it. I see that, Sean, in your writings, you're, you know, people are looking like, where's my funding coming from and mm -hmm. uh, stuff like that. And I think that that's where a lot of people kind of start the conversation is they realize, as I did, I'm not going to be able to pay myself to do this, or I'm not going to be able to pay myself enough or whatever. I mean, I, I love that my journey brought me around to thinking a little differently about that, where I started to say, wow, not only where does my paycheck come from, but what's actually advantageous as far mm. as connecting with the community. But the the where is my funding coming from question is a huge piece. And then you're going to do certain things with part of your time, right? Mm. So that's how it... Well, let, let me ask you to un, unpack this a little bit more based, based on that. Uh, uh, I, I love that approach, uh, because as a person who's grown up in church, been around church all my life, et cetera, et cetera, uh, I knew the right terms. Sure. But I, I think that's a great way of thinking about it. Somebody who doesn't know that and is saying, hey, look, I, I've done this training. Uh, and there are a lot of people, uh, you know, that have gone through. I mean, I've, I've known bivocational pastors that were medical doctors, yeah. that were uh, advertising executives that, I mean, had good paying full-time kind of jobs, yeah. but they felt called to the Lord and they use that as a ministry. And then they also are helping plant a church or helping pastor a church or serving on staff in a church or whatever. Yeah. So I love the way you put that, Sean, uh, your, your vocation remains the same to be a witness for Jesus Christ. You're proclaiming the gospel through everything that you are in your life. And so your avocation, your occupation mm -hmm. may vary and they could be a number of different things, but all of those can serve as ways to reach the community uh, and help you fulfill what your vocation is as yeah. a believer, yeah. as a Christian. And, and I would add with that, and Andy alluded to it, and most often the, the work that we're doing on the side has so much more traction in ministry than in the minute. Like there's more, like I would say it like this, and I won't, I won't bat an eye. For me, there's significantly more ministry that happens outside of my ministry than in ministry. You know, if that makes sense. And so, but I, but we, we, we still have that separation. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I fully get that. Uh, when I had the photography businesses I had a number of years ago, I found the very same thing. People would show up at my church for a funeral or something and they'd go, wait a minute. You're a photographer. <laughs> they, they didn't know I was pastor of a church. Uh, they knew me from the photography, you know, and so it it built built credibility. I mean, there were all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. uh, let's use that as a springboard. H help us understand maybe some of the keys to successful mm -hmm. part time or bivocational ministry uh, when you're working these other jobs, when you're doing these other things. What, what are some keys to success? 
Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I, I am very much a proponent, and I think in the book we're trying to get at this, is that there is not a path here. Um, that there, you really are going to have to discern a lot of things about yourself and about your path. So I'm, I'm working with, uh, my entire staff now is bivocational. So I've got a staff of five bivocational folks, and then we're working with training up two bivocational planters as well at the moment, outside of that staff. Every single one is a completely different story. So, um, you know, with one of these, one of these planters, he's got his own real estate business. So he makes his own schedule. He can really like manipulate it however he wants. He can tell one of his clients, hey, look, I can't do that time. I've got something else going on. It's it's very malleable. I actually think that's one of the, in for people like me, that's one of the best situations. But he also has to be very good at commanding his own time and making his own boundaries and so on and so forth. The other kind of planter and resident we have is uh, he's got a he's got a nine to five, you know, and so he's like unavailable all day every weekday. That's going to be challenging um, for him in many ways. But then at the same time, there are clear cut boundaries. I'm at work now. I'm off. He doesn't have responsibility for his work himself to where if something falls apart, he's not up all weekend fixing it. It's not his company. So that's, it has some benefits. And, um, and so I think that they're just, I guess what I'm saying is you have to, you have to kind of do the work to say, what kind of structure do I need? What kind of freedom do I need? How much capacity do I have? And then what am I good at? What am I passionate at? And then start to piece together. So what, what could I do? Um, And I think that that journey is just going to be, different for everybody. I told one story in the book about a young college minister who came asking us for funding and I told him no. And I let, I kind of let him know basically that he already got as much funding as I got as a pastor um, and that nobody at our church made as much as him. So, you know, that I suggested he maybe should do something by vocationally. And he was like kind of thrown off. And, mm-hmm. and then I said, so what do you, what do you do now? And he's like, well, I, I'm a graphic designer. And I was like, oh, okay, at the college where you work? And he's like, oh, yeah, kind of. And I was like, hey, you know, <laughs> that's actually really great. Like, why would you get rid of that gig? And he said, oh, I, I don't know. I, I, you know, I just want to focus on ministry. I was like, what's your one inroad to the lives of unbelievers right now where they get to see your general like skills and work ethic and who you are? And it hit him, you know, oh, right. And so some, some of us, I think it's in there if we just kind of started to think that way. And for others of us, that might be a new exploration. So anyway, I'd love to give you the list, but I think it's just so <laughs> individual. Yeah, well, I, and I, I think I agree with you. And in today's world, we live in more of a, uh, what I've heard termed a side gig economy. Yeah. Uh, you know, the Ubers, the Lyfts, the, mm. uh, you know, the, the food delivery. I mean, all of these different kind of side mm. gigs that right. have lots of flexibility, uh, and I've even known uh, a couple of planters that, uh, I mean, their, their kind of full-time side gig is, is driving for Uber and, uh, they love it because they learn their community. They mm-hmm. learn their city so well because they have to, to be able to drive it and they're meeting people constantly. They have all kinds of encounters, uh, that they get to meet people and, and learn, uh, about the, the context in which they're serving. So, uh, I yeah, think there's a lot just, of that stuff's well, really I, beautiful for kind of the Sean's and I like we we like to have multiple things going on. I mean, that's I, I love like today I was in my store. I had a ministry conversation. I had to go to the DMV for the church. I'm interviewing with you. I'm going to a movie night we're hosting at the church like the gear hmm. shifting that I'm doing just today is pretty, pretty interesting. And that for me is fun. There are hmm. other folks who that would that would just destroy mm. them, you know? And, yeah. and so I'm aware that that's not everybody can do that. And so some people need kind of, maybe they need to have two things that are very similar mm. and kind of happen in blocks of time. Um, and that's, that's okay. It's, it's kind of figuring that out. That's the journey. What were you going to say, mm. Sean? Well, no, I'm just going to continue on with what you said. You said a couple words that, that I'm definitely passionate at passion about and you had mentioned like again i think part of the the reframing of part-time bivo covo is just letting people know like it <laughs> it doesn't have to suck you know what right. i mean because usually when we think of bivo it's like all right i mean i went to seminary i got my degree 
I raised funds. I planted a church. I went to ministry and like, oh, it's not working out. And that's like, I got to go get a job that I hate. That's just soul sucking. Yeah. Whereas where I reframe it again, I'm mostly working with the people on the front end, helping them start businesses and nonprofits. It's like, like, what are you good at? What are you interested in? And what are you passionate about? And how do you create a career around that? Now, that could mean going back to school, getting an education around that. That could be like a certain skill set that you could start something. Whereas, like, and it's different, but it's where it becomes just as life giving yeah. as ministry. But it, but it is ministry, right? It's it's a different kind. So, if, you know. But it's, it's, go ahead, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, it can even be life-saving in in a way. Like there's another story I tell in the book is about my church planting buddy who would build furniture in his time off, you know, and that wasn't a job, but there's something about having sometimes like, sometimes your bivocational role, it is, it is life-giving in a way and so, and it is ministry and you're going to bump into different people, but also, I mean, Frankly, a lot of times, I mean, when you think about soul sucking, I mean, ministry is soul sucking, like literally sucking <laughs> from your soul. And that sometimes it's kind of nice to like, you know, run some TPS reports or stir up a cup of, a cup of coffee, you know? I mean, it's like, it's not necessarily even the worst thing for you in, mm-hmm. in some situations. And chances are it's going to get you out in front of a whole different crowd. And uh, you've raised a a couple of other issues here that I think are really important for us to delve into just a little bit. Uh, uh, One is almost every part-time pastor or bivocational pastor is potentially going to look different. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, if you're a nine to five, then that's different than, uh, you know, you're working at a bank or a marketing company or something else is very different than uh, something where you have control over the schedule, like the Mm -hmm. the intern that you mentioned. Um, but one of the things that I always struggle with, and and I'm I'm curious to hear if you guys have this same tension uh, in in bivocational ministry. But I've always struggled with that time, the mm-hmm. time management. How how do I have enough time? I, I and I'm a I'm a driven person, so so mm-hmm. I, I I'm giving 120 percent oftentimes to everything. You know, I'm overdoing uh, at that point. Uh, so I, I want you to talk uh, just a little bit about, uh, uh, I think you use the term principle of distribution, or mm-hmm. or maybe I added that, but you use the word distribution. <laughs> that sounds uh, like a uh, subset yeah. of, yeah. in the theology well, book or something. Yeah, that's, that's, that's my the organizational head. I, no, yeah, I, I, like I had to call it a principle. Or, you know, no, but, uh, no, I but, think that, that, I know that comes from the chapter that, I, one of the chapters I wrote, because I was trying to refer to kind of like this idea of like, a point guard, right? The point, like, obviously there's like point guards that are shooting guards and there's point guards that are really, their main role is distribution. We think of like Chris Paul, CP3, like he's great, obviously can score, but he makes the offense go, but it doesn't revolve around he, him and he distributes. And I think one of the remedies that part-time pastoring does is, well, you can't be the dude, right? You have to delegate, you have to, you know, distribute the ministry. And I think that also does a healthy job in the church, right? I mean, you could speak definitely more into this, Andy, because like you, you, you just can't do it all. You, you have to delegate, you have to raise up leaders, you have to get others involved and share the ministry. Um, whereas if you're just full time, it that's, you're kind of like, I'm just going to do it myself kind of thing. So, so I think there's some, some healthy, patterns that can push us towards even against our will. Go ahead, Andy. Yeah, no, I, I 100% agree with that. And I assume there are people who are bivocational who are still trying to be like, carry the mm-hmm. whole thing. And that's mm-hmm. not going to go well for you. And also, I think that you have to be clear with your church. So there's so many different church situations. Are you walking into an established church? Or are you planting? If you're planting, you can set DNA. I mean, about, you know, around a lot of things. And so that's a whole different scenario, but then you can also set bad DNA, like high Mm. expectations that you can't fulfill, for example. But, um, but you do need to be honest with your church about what, what it looks like to carry the ministry and that this is going to have to be a team effort. Um, But I definitely think that there's more understanding from your church that that is what Mm. you need when you have another job. I mean, it just, 
and, and I, and I don't even think that's just a practice to help the pastor be bivocational. I think it's healthy for the church to do the work of the ministry together. Right. And so when the pastor doesn't, isn't perceived as having just like unlimited time available, it sort of, I think is helpful for the church to go, Oh, well, if that's going to happen, we're going to have to do it with them. And then it, it allows it, it for us, like embracing bivocationalism, you know, you hear me say, Oh, you have five staff. Our budget is, you know, for churches with five staff is tiny. Um, but we're, we're all bivocational. And what we've done is we've taken the role at the church that we're best at. And so when you're hiring full-time people, you feel like you have to fill up their job description with stuff that maybe they're not even really good at. Um, mm-hmm. When you're hiring part-time, you can, you can go, okay, you're administrative. We need 10 hours of that. Would you like 10 hours of administration? Awesome. Um, and, uh, and so like our, our musician, I mean, how many churches have full-time musicians? Like, do you really, I don't know. Like, do you need 40 hours of musician? Like, but like our, our guy who does music, I, Oh, I wasn't supposed <laughs> to say that. Sorry. <laughs> All you, all you, out there. <laughs> you stir up, stir up the music, folks. Now we're gonna have trouble. Making the Kovo people mad. I'm making the musician. Mad. Um, but uh, but uh, no, for real though. And and our like our guy runs sound for the for the university athletics. And not everybody can have that gig. But I mean, but it's great because he comes in, does an amazing job with music. We could never really pay him what he's worth, to be honest. Like not anytime soon. But because he has time to do other things it works so okay guys unpack for me a little bit of uh of how do you how do you establish the rhythm Mm -hmm. that you need in in this kind of a ministry now i understand the the kind of work you're doing is is different i mean for different people Mm -hmm. in different situations but but uh, what what are some keys some 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 Mm -hmm. principles for establishing some kind of a rhythm so that you can feel you use the term uh um, uh, I think it was Andy, you said uh, soul sucking, you know, yeah. uh, again, suck you dry. And that can be true mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually, uh, all that. I mean, what do you do to establish that rhythm? Well, if I've, uh, I've failed at that a lot and learned some lessons along the way. And I mean, I guess if I had to just kind of make up a couple of key points, I would say schedule time to do nothing. Um, I think that's something that I do is I've tried to start scheduling time to just like, I drove to one of Sean's and my favorite little towns, Bisbee on Monday, Mm. cause I had a hard week. So I put it in my schedule and sorry, I'm booked. And I just went to, went to Bisbee and walked around and drank coffee and read a book. And, uh, and I think there was a time when I didn't feel the freedom to do that. Mm. And that made it, that made it difficult because your time, it'll get filled up. I mean, that's Mm. especially, especially when you're bivocational. Mm. And then the other thing, I mean, I think Sean and I, maybe this is our next book, but just we've both quit doing things, right? Like we've both started a business that we've gotten rid of. Um, We've both decided this isn't working. Um, And so I think there's a a willingness in there Mm. too. If something is starting to become a behemoth that's kind of taking over or is, starting to drain you like it is okay for it to have a season of time um you know that i i really struggled with the the main business that i started we we split it into two pieces but and i kept part of it but i really struggled with letting go of the other part um just as a big piece of who i was but but i think that was an absolutely essential decision for me so yeah i don't know sean you could probably speak to that too yeah i mean I think there's so much, and I think that's why I know you had talked about there, there are many different paths because the reality is like temperament wise, we can get lost in Enneagram, DISC, Myers-Briggs, whatever, but like we're all wired different. So I think part of it is just knowing who you are and even our capacity. Some could look at your schedule, my schedule and be like, there's no way. And others could be like, that's like Tuesday, right? You know what I mean? And so, so I think just knowing what your capacity is, you know, are you people oriented, task oriented? Like for me, I, I know I, I can crank stuff done. I can get stuff out. I just know I'm really efficient, you know? And so I can add a lot more to my plate. And then kind of like what you were talking about before, Andy, is just, there are definitely negotiables, like not just like getting away, but just like even the little things like every day, like I'm going to get eight hours of sleep. 
Right. I'm going to have my quiet times. I'm going to spend an hour exercising or go to the, you know what I mean? Ride my bike, go to the gym, whatever. Like I, I did, I need that. Otherwise I'm going to go like, I just can't handle it. So I think you can build in the rhythms on a daily, weekly, monthly basis that, um, you can, yeah, just that creating, we'll just call it margins. You got to create margins, um, and, and make those non-negotiable even, when there's because the work never ends on the ministry yeah. front or whatever we're doing, whether it's yeah, whatever there's it's never ending. And and I there's think always the there's same. always something else. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of the same problem for people in full time ministry, though. Really, I mean, it's again like the list can get really really long. I mm-hmm. I think it's the same principle. It's just building in knowing mm-hmm. knowing what you need, building in your yeah. buffers and sticking yeah. to. It. Well, let me ask you this, uh, is part-time pastoring for everyone? And if it's not, what kind of questions do you think somebody Mm. should ask to uh, help them evaluate if this Mm. is something for me? Mm. I guess I'll I'll jump in. Let me jump in on this. Otherwise, I'll lose my train of thought. (laughs) And uh, and I know we were talking about this before we started recording. So for me, it's... It's really the realization that like we're, we're, we, we're couching this conversation from the perspective of privilege. You know what I mean? You think about it, like I can choose to be by vote. I can choose not like all of us have that choice, right? We could go get a sweet gig at some big church and be bored out of our mind. And what, you know what I mean? Like we have that choice. And, you know, whereas, whereas, you know, church leaders in the majority world, like, there is no choice, right? And so that's just a, you know, being by vocation, working full time, whether it's in education, government, farming, whatever, that, that's just, there is no, like, I don't, I choose, I don't have it, you know what I mean? And so, so I always like to recognize that, like, we, again, that's not like to shame or guilt us. These are, this is the context that we're in, but it's just that recognition that, well, we have that choice. Um, and so then since we have that choice, I think then that question, then I can answer that question to go again, that's where I like to get into like kind of wrestling with like the sense of calling and vocation that we have in our lives and what's the best pathway towards that. Mm-hmm. And for me, it was that recognition to go, man, I thrive when I have, a, a when I have, I hate the job, but when I have a job outside of ministry, which is horrible theology, but for context, <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? So like, I, if I don't have that, I just, I wither, like I need to do more things. I need that. I need, I just need it. So. Yeah. So, right. That's exactly. I would say that it's just the same thing we've been saying capacity, know your capacity. I, I have no doubt that there's some people out there and maybe who are even listening to this. That's like general gen, like genuinely could not do a pastorate, another job and like raise your family or whatever, like maybe. Mm-hmm. And that's, that is okay. Like if you can see that, know it and own it, you know, and that's all right. Um, but then I think that I would say, as Sean is saying too, like that position of privilege is diminishing. There are going to be less and less full-time ministry positions. So if you feel this call, you really should consider that now or in the future, that might be the only way. And so I think swallowing that is a, a really important piece. Like, is this a calling from God or is this a, you know, decent career path? Because if it's just the career path thing, it may not work out for you. If it's a calling from God, I suppose you'll probably do whatever you need to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, then there's, I think another question would be just your community's needs. I've had to wrestle with this. Like, what if, what if it came, what if a day came when our church changed and like the elders of my church came to me and said, Andy, we, uh, we need more of your time. Would I do that? Um, and I think I would hope that I would be listening to the spirit and my leaders to say, if they need me, if that's what they really need you know, either we're finding somebody to fill that gap or, or I could let it go. I'm, I'm open to that. Um, but I've also seen, I've seen a lot of pastors later in their career who had this full-time period where then it changed either because the church got smaller or because like the newer, younger leader was raised up or whatever. And that's a healthy thing. So you might go back to some form of bivocationalism, and um, so I think I think it it's for a lot of people, not everybody, and it's for times and seasons in different ways. 
And then I think the, the bigger question though, that I really want people to think about the most is what serves the mission of, of God the most for you to do. And to really consider that potentially, especially in kind of a post-Christian culture, very few people who don't know Christ are asking what the church thinks about anything. Um, in fact, being a pastor for me in my context in Tucson, Arizona is a great way to shut a conversation down. So like if, if your mission involves reaching people for Christ, you really, really should consider, you know, doing something in and among them that they understand and respect and where you can collaborate. That's probably an excellent strategy. You know, one of the things I used to when I was working uh, with church planting assessors and we were assessing church planters, um, there, there was this phraseology that was used by a lot of people is we're looking for five star uh, church planters, five star church planters, five star church planters. And, and they would constantly say that. And, and I, I tried to communicate to all of our team, look, potentially every person in the room is a five star planter. If you understand the context, because a, a guy uh, and I was in Michigan at the time, so uh, I use that as my illustration, uh, a guy who could be a five star planter in a Detroit could right. blow it up terrible up in in northern uh, Michigan, uh, where it's open country and rural, uh, a, a guy who maybe was a five-star planter in an open country rural setting would just die if he would, had to be in a big city like Detroit. Uh, you have to understand, you have to match, you have to understand who you are, what your capacity is. And Andy, you're exactly right. I, I couldn't say it any better that understanding who you are, you may not be able to have three other gig jobs uh, on top of what you're doing in ministry, you need to know what you're doing to be able to have a, a, a good ebb and flow and a balance. And what we talked about trying to have that rhythm, you know, in your your life to be able to, to have. A, I use the word balance. I learned a long time ago. There's really no such word as balance when you're in, in ministry, uh, but because uh, it goes up and down, you know, at different times. Uh, but you have to you have to do everything. It's just like I love the story. Andy about just getting in the car and getting away for a while because right. uh, you need that. You need that kind of thing. Well, look, guys, let, let's wrap it up with this. I want to ask you, uh, you make a, an argument in the book as you're wrapping things up that really part-time pastoring and part-time ministry really is the future. Uh, Sean, you jumped into that just a little bit uh, a minute ago, but I want us to kind of unpack that as we kind of wrap things up here. Uh, why, why do you really think that really is the, the future uh, for us to effectively be able to communicate Christ to a lost culture uh, here in, in the North America? Bobby, I want to I want to pick up on something you said, and I will. I am going to get to what you just asked, but another nuance that you brought up was ha had to do with place. You know, you talked about different cities and different contexts. Something that I really appreciate that Sean writes about a lot is that you know our, a lot of our models included sending people off with these big budgets to places that they don't know, and um, and often it's because you've trained up the experts in the academy or whatever, and then you're you're shipping them to where you feel the need is. When you think of, and that often doesn't work, it can, um, but it often doesn't work. And we've seen that happen in all of our contexts, I'm sure. Um, I've seen it recently. But when you grow up kind of homegrown leaders in a context that they understand, um, there's, there's a lot of benefit. A lot more of those churches stick. And you'll also see a lot more commitment. Like these are the, these are the leaders who are willing to do something like bivocationalism and are willing to take it slow because they understand the context and the challenges. So when I, when I hear, you know, Sean talk about Portland, like you can tell he's, he's owned Portland, Portland's home. And he really is, has come to understand it. Um, Tucson for me is very much home. I I've seen, I've seen other pastors come around here. I have one conversation at coffee with them and I'm going, nobody's going to like you here. Like, it's just, <laughs> I can just tell. And, and, you know, there's, it's like, you're not a Tucson person. You're going to need like years to become one, you know, are you up for that? And so that's, that's another layer of, mm. of all of this that I think is, is really helpful. But so with the future being part-time, I, I really think we're going to need more homegrown leaders. I think we're going to need people who raise up out of their contexts. 
um, because in the post-Christian world, those are the people who are going to be trusted. Outside Christian experts, nobody's looking for them. I mean, look on the news. Who's looking for them? They're, we're looking for spokesmen to try to explain Christians. You know, that's why Russell Moore is always on. They're like, please help us understand them. And he's trying, you right? But like the nobody's asking for the, the Christian expert spokesman. So homegrown leaders who mm. are Christians who are known, that's that's just effective strategy. So I think mm. that's one of the many reasons that the future is going to have more and more part-time bivocational, yeah. co-vocational leaders. Yeah. And I'll continue to, to go on that because again, I mean, I write about it a bit and talk about it lots and just ob- observations and 20 years of church planning. I mean, that's, that's the, that, that, that's the common storyline, right? Dude raises a lot of money, usually moves from the South to someplace like a Tucson or Portland five, eight years later, he's gone. Right. Yeah. Got a lot of hype, but just, just blew $750,000. Right. But then his response is like stark. People don't get the gospel. I'm just like, Oh, but it's, it's just Portland or it's just Tucson. Yeah. You know what I mean? But then, but then I see all the guys who are local, whether they're pastoring or planting. And I think this is where it ties into bivocational is like, well, they're home. They're already, they're not going anywhere. And so it's almost like if, if they got to be bivo, I'm home. Like I'm, I have nowhere to rush off to. I'm not going anywhere. And so it's like, it's almost like uh, this is just what you do to, to stay home. And you, you know what I mean? And I'm, oh, I'm, I'm not there yet. And I won't ever come out and say, all right, let's just stop sending church planners from one side of the country to the next. But sometimes I'm a little bit close, but, but I think, but I think part of it too is, because that's predicated on a, a on a funding model of like a timestamp of American culture that's just no longer present. And, and, you know, as we continue to transition where we are um, again, we're seeing giving down, you know, across denominations, across mission agencies. And this is not even just a U.S. thing. I serve on the board of international mission organization and just this whole uptick of like, Oh, we need, we need to have, more of these kind of conversations with our missionaries because this whole like funding stream you're going to raise lifetime support to go to nepal or whatever like that's becoming more and more difficult and so more mission agencies are trying to have a track to go like well what if you actually went there and started like a business or something and i know business and mission is not anything new but there's definitely an uptick just because how we've traditionally funded ministries domestically and internationally like that money is i'm not saying it's going to dry up or anything like that so it's going to push more people into this way and i think our hope is for this book is to say like yeah but this way is amazing like it's yeah. like it's like come on in the water is great this is yeah this is awesome right and so again it's not anti-intellectualism like i went to college i went to seminary like i love and i work in higher ed like i love school and teaching and like all that kind of stuff. So it's not a push against that, but it's just like, yeah, it's just this, the shift, the continual, yeah. Every culture's dynamic. Right. So. Yeah, that's a good point. And when I say something about people being sent from like the Academy, I actually see so much value in that, especially in like what you're doing, Sean, where in the Academy, you're preparing people for these multiple paths you're and you're giving them tools to to do multiple things you know where it's often i and i've always i've always kind of had an issue with the transplanted church model but that's like for me it's when you go to the academy and you learn one version of church and you try to go and live that out in a part of the world where it doesn't fit at all um and so I think that i think we have a ton a ton to learn a lot of great amazing educated people to send we just got to learn how to do it different because um, it's that model's breaking at the mm-hmm. moment. Well, and yeah, when it comes to church planting that uh, what I, I've always called the parachute uh, planters, you know, yeah. you parachute them in and you buy them a house, you give them a good salary, you give them startup money, you know, all that, whatever. And you're right, uh, Sean, uh, three, four, five years down the road, oftentimes they're gone. Uh, money's run out. They hadn't been able to raise more money and, uh, it requires a lot. And so the failure rate's pretty high uh, sometimes on those. And, mm. you know, another thing, and we need to wrap it up, but uh, another thing that, that you've hit on, 
the the loyalty to the community mm, yes. is so much higher. Mm. And the other thing I've noticed is the commitment mm. between pastor and people in that kind of situation is is so much tighter sometimes mm. uh, because they're they're walking together. And this is where I mean I didn't I didn't ship in from somewhere. This is home. You know, uh, this is where I live. Uh, I plan on staying here. And so uh, uh, it, it's a uh, I, I hate to talk about, you know, power struggles in churches, but there, it's there mm -hmm. and the political things that happen in churches as well. But a guy who is bivocational, there, there's some strength he has to not having been his family's income be totally dependent mm -hmm. upon that church. Uh, and there's some huge advantages to that. Um I've, For sure. I've shared that with uh, with potential bivocational planters that you're just you're not as beholden to the church edifice and the big donors. I mean, it's 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 it changes the dynamic a little bit. And that's not the that's not the big reason for me, but it's a factor. <laughs> sure. It, it does change. Yeah. The, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can uh, although I wouldn't advise saying it, but you can look in the eyes of that that bully in the church or whatever you want to call it and say, I don't really care. <laughs> mm. I don't care. This is what I feel God's leading us to do. And that's what we need to do. And you're not pulling the purse strings uh, to put pressure on me uh, because especially, you know, a, a guy's got a young family and whatever, boy, I mean, that's, that's tough. You know, that's tough. And so, mm. yeah, there are some advantages to bivocationalism like that. Well, look, guys, we do need to wrap it up. Uh, Andy Littleton, uh, Sean Benish, uh, this book, uh, Part-Time Pastoring, a great read. Uh, I hope that lots of folks will get it and uh, really uh, digest it. It'll encourage them from a positive perspective uh, as well. Uh, Andy, you kind of uh, were a driving force. Uh, let me give you the last word here. Anything you would like to say as we kind of wrap it up? Up, anyone who would uh, be looking at uh, this as an option? Oh yeah, I mean, I think if if you're even thinking about it, you really should you really should dive all the way in and consider it. I consider our book uh, to be kind of a like an entryway into the conversation. This this particular book is kind of a like a little field guide for getting started. I think there's really great stuff. I think I think follow everything Brad Briscoe does and and co-vocational church planning is real thick. Uh, Sean has written a lot of other books on that get you just into strategy and thinking about place and and all sorts of you know great angles on this and and you can go you can go very deep into it um, but I, I would encourage you to I think it's the future I think even if you aren't going to be bivocational you're probably going to work with people who are and you should understand it so at the very least uh, become more familiar it's going to be a thing. <laughs>